Okay. Uh, let's see. All of you guys can hear me. So I do this quite often, but I'll admit it's a bit surreal being here and speaking in English to a bunch of people that I know and I speak to in Greek. And also, more importantly, um, you know, I was talking to my wife and I said, gee, I'm actually a bit nervous about this. And I said, I'm never nervous, but you know, that's what happens when you're speaking to a bunch of people you actually know instead of like a bunch of people who do you don't really know. So anyway, it's a special privilege to, uh, to be here, especially given all the entrepreneurial activities that are happening on Cyprus. Um, uh, for me, one of my personal passions is, is the place that I grew up in. Um, and uh, after doing a whole lot of work in the States around fostering the entrepreneurial mindset of, um, of Americans, I thought, this is crazy. I have to do something um, for the place um, that I owe everything to. And um, uh, I will be Cypriot forever, so I'm thrilled to be here. So I, and I'm very proud of it. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll uh, make the presentation in two parts. I'll talk first about my, uh, my journey to Sonic Bids and a bit of my background and how I found myself at, uh, at Berkeley and the sort of all kinds of twists and turns that my, my journey's taken. And then I'll give you an overview of what we're doing at, uh, at Berkeley and how I feel many of these things are actually applicable into this particular ecosystem that we're building um, in, uh, in Cyprus. So there it is, 13 years in 15 minutes. So I'll try and be quick. Um, so by default, this will be a caricature of my life rather than all the facts, which would take several days to go through. Um, so I was, I was born here in Nicosia, not, not too far. Um, I fell in love with electric guitar after I saw a movie called Back to the Future. I don't know if anybody's seen it. Um, so yes, watching a movie can change your life. Um, I watched it maybe 40 times and I decided I wanted to be a guitar player. I applied to Berkeley. I got into Berkeley because back then they had an acceptance rate of 78%, unlike today when they have an acceptance rate of 24%. Uh, so that's how a guy like me got in. But like many people who went to Berkeley, I realized very, very early on that um, I wasn't as talented as I thought. Um, so that was one of my early entrepreneurial failures, if you will. Um, so I decided to study music business, which was one of the first, um, uh, I was one of the first students to actually study this new uh, major. And I thought, I love music and I like to talk. Here's two things that are marrying my passion which is one lesson right there. Whatever you're doing, find things that blend your, your passion. So I ended up doing music, music business. I got an internship at a, at a big talent agency in, in Boston um, where I found myself booking all of the idols that I, I, I grew up with. Uh, people, uh, for those of you who know jazz, people like Pat Metheny, the guitar player, and uh, Chick Corea, brand for Marsalis. I actually ended up bringing a lot of these people in Cyprus back in, in the 90s. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm that old to have been an adult in the 90s. Um, but it was through my experience as, as a talent agent that I got the inspiration to start my company. And this is something that I tell a lot of young entrepreneurs. I think sometimes there's a lot of pressure today for young people to start companies out of universities and out of colleges. But I feel that going out there and gaining experience and being inspired by the environment around you or being inspired by the people that you work for can make an enormous difference. Um, after all, our companies are products of our experiences very much like if you're a musician, your music is a product of your experience. Um, so at my company, we had the following problem. We couldn't take you on as a client unless you were making $3,000 a night or, or more. Oops, I went to sleep. Uh, okay. Sorry, it's my computer. Uh, unless you were making $3,000 um, a night or more. Uh, you, you may say, $3,000, that's a lot of money. But if you think about it, a talent agent makes a 10% commission. So it takes a whole lot of work to make $300. In a funny way, it's easier to book an artist for $30,000 than it is to book an artist for $3,000 because the artist who's making $3,000, nobody wants them. And the artist who makes $30,000, everybody wants them. So I would say it doesn't take a genius to book people like Pat Metheny or Chick Corea. I would just sit back and take phone calls. So I thought, OK, all my friends that I grew up with or, or spent time with at Berkeley, none of them were making $3,000. So I thought, where do these people go? How do they connect with music promoters? And we had a philosophy at the time that there was always a music promoter out there to book an artist. The question is, how long does it take you? And how expensive is it to connect with them? So put, your contact, put yourself into 
the mindset of what it was like um, in the late 1990s. You know, the internet was, was becoming very, very popular. So I thought, huh, you know, I wonder if I can create a website um, that effectively makes it easy for people who play music and people who book music to connect with each other. So in many ways, that was the inspiration. It was something very, very simple. We often think of innovation as being something that, you know, you, you, you come up out of the ether. But for me, innovation was taking a concept that was existing somewhere else that was in the job market where people looking for jobs and people who were offering the jobs would connect. And I thought, why can't I just recreate this but with musicians? So that was the birth of my company. Um, I, the problem, I had one problem. I had never coded a single line of code in my life. I'm not a technologist. So I also want to dispel another myth that entrepreneurship is about, um, you know, having a bunch of resources or that you have to have 100% domain expertise in, in what you were doing. So, you know, I, I ended up thinking, um, okay, who do I know? So I'm not going to make this a very long story, but I ended up stumbling onto a guy from Bulgaria who really helped me code my my first website. I spent a lot of time researching the early market. And, and here's what's interesting. I found some surprising facts. Out of $15 billion that was being exchanged between the people who were booking music, and, and think of this as, you know, everybody from cruise ships and festivals and amusement parks and clubs and colleges, think of everywhere that music is performed. In the United States, that's a very large market. It's $15 billion but only about 9% of that was going to um, the top uh, music performers, you know, the, the Madonnas of the world or the people that I was booking or the Rolling Stones or, or U2. The other 90 plus percent or the bulk of the money was actually going to over four and a half million young bands who were playing nightly in all these different places that didn't have representation. So in many ways, this is what really encouraged me that there was something there. It's, it's what they call the iceberg model. It's what's, what's on the tip. It's, one, it's what's on the bottom that, that we focused on. Um, and like Anastasia said, I, I didn't have a, a whole lot of money. I ended up starting the company out of my apartment. I, I started with $50,000 of my savings and with a lot of help from my family um, and friends. But this is sort of the early resourcefulness that I think you need when you're starting something. It's not about resources, but it's about being resourceful. Any more than if you want to cook a great, a great meal, you know, it, it, you, you, I say that a chef can, a great chef can make a great meal out of very limited ingredients. Somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, you can give them the best ingredients on the planet, they won't make anything out of it. And for me, an entrepreneur is somebody who knows how to leverage ultimately what, you know, what they have and make something bigger from that. Um, Today, SonicBits has grown quite a bit. It's a, it's a grown up, it's 15 years later. Sometimes I have to pinch myself that this little thing that I started is 15 years old. Um, it's become the standard way that uh, bands and people who book music connect online, especially this, what we call this artistic middle class. So we've been always focused on a very particular audience. It wasn't about the very big artists. It was always about sort of this, this mid-tier of artists that are playing nightly, uh, if you will. And um, I'm also very proud that we were an early platform for a lot of very, very well-known artists since then. Probably a lot of you in the audience won't recognize a lot of these names, but in the US, many of them are household names. And it's one of the things that drove me from the beginning. How do we give voice to all these young, aspiring artists out there. That's what motivated me from the beginning. I, I like to say that most entrepreneurs that I know don't start businesses because they want to make a bunch of money. Most entrepreneurs start businesses because they want to make a difference, fundamentally. Um, we also work with um, uh, many of the world's most established music promoters and festivals, many of which use us as the exclusive platform. Um, I, as Anastasia mentioned earlier, we have nearly 600,000 bands from all over the world that use the site and some 40,000 uh, events. But this is the statistic that I'm the most proudest, uh, proudest of. Since we started, over 1.2 million shows happened through the website. 
Um, these are 1.2 million experiences that people all over the world have had because of a very small idea that I once had. Um, and I've always been attracted at this asymmetrical effects that you can have in the world, that sometimes big change happens with you know, very, very small, uh, small steps. And when I was motivating my employees, it was rarely about, ah, gee, let's, let's, you know, let's take the company public or, or let's sell it to the next highest bidder. But it was about the human stories behind our customers. I'll remember the very first time that I was in Seville, Spain, and I met a female Iranian DJ. Now, put these three words together. <laughs> and she was playing for the very first time outside of Iran using the platform in Seville. And she came and hugged me and told me about her mom being an Iranian uh, uh, filmmaker who was persecuted and, and fled the country and that we were giving her a voice. Or I, I was in Austin, Texas, and this young woman from Egypt came and hugged me and, and said, this is my first time playing in America and I'm fronting a metal band. I mean, how cool is this? A young Egyptian girl is fronting a, an Egyptian metal band playing in America. Or we had an Icelandic artist who toured China for the first time. Or I met a band from the Faroe Islands. See, I'm from a small island, so you know, I happen to uh, uh, make it my job to know about other small islands. But Americans barely know where Cyprus is, let alone the Faroe Islands. But I, we had a disproportionate amount of artists from Iceland and the Faroe Islands. I'm not really sure why. Um, maybe Icelanders like us like really want to just go out there and, and, and meet people. But you know, they were from the Faroe Islands and they got a, a gig or a show in Holland. But companies are about people. They're about these stories that you're weaving and you're creating. And this is what motivates people that work for you. I found that it's not so much about going out there and making a lot of money. Sure, that's a byproduct of a good job. But it's about the way that you affect people that makes a difference. Um, and uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember Spando Ballet, I like to have song titles um, in my presentations. Great song, by the way. If you don't know it, you should find out. Um, here's a few things that I learned in my 13 years of running a company. Uh, I think you can already gather, at, gather this. Follow your passion. Do something that you care about. Uh, I never understood when I pick up magazines that say, 101 businesses start today to make a million dollars. Whatever. I like to follow my passions because if you do what you love, as a very famous Chinese philosopher said, you've never worked a day in your life. People ask me all the time about raising money and they won't tell me about their ideas, right? And they're like, oh, please sign this non-disclosure agreement so I can talk to you about my idea. Who cares? Everybody has the same idea that you do or about another hundred people. What makes a difference is people. Investors put money in human beings. They don't put money in ideas, okay? I can't stress this enough. Um, simplicity always wins. How many of you have an Apple phone in your pocket as we speak? Um, keep it simple. Often because as entrepreneurs, we're creative beings, we want to do everything. And there's another thing. Oh, and I have another idea. But it's about keeping it focused. And for me, we had all kinds of people say to me, ah, you know, come and why don't you do it for actors? Why don't you do it for magicians? Why don't you do it for speakers? Why don't you do it for comedians, models? And I'm like, no, I want to do one thing and be the best at it. Um, I don't really like to use military analogies when I talk about business because I think it's overstated, but I'll use it this one time. There's a famous general called von Clausewitz who said the first casualty of war is the battle plan. So that's why my third, my fourth point there is make a plan, then throw it away. What does this mean? Business plans are important, but they're no more important than notes or scales are to music. You know, can you play music without knowing how to read music? Of course you can. Paul McCartney, the most famous composer of all time that wrote music that all of us listen to, can't read a note. Okay. Can you tell me that every entrepreneur that you know that's successful actually sat down and understands all the uh, specifics of, of business, uh, business jargon? Of course not. Are you better off putting a plan together? Of course, any plan is better than no plan. But don't, let's not overstate the importance of business plans, and more importantly, be adaptable. 
Um, a friend of mine gave me this advice because when I was younger, I was focused on being the smartest person in the room. Maybe it's a Cypriot thing. Um, <laughs> he says, if, Panos, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're getting really bad advice. And you know, if you're in a band, if you're the best musician in the band, the band sucks, right? You become only better if you're around better people. If you're in a football team, you know, you want to play with Messi. I don't know how Messi feels. <laughs> I'm not Messi. But if you surround yourself with great people, you will build a great business. And for me, the biggest challenge that I had in my life is finding great people. When I find great people, it's effortless. When I've hired the wrong people, I have to be on top of them all the time. I hate that. Um, for those of you who've seen The Godfather, I think The Godfather has ruined thousands of young business people with this very famous advice by Marlon Brando. Uh, it's not personal, it's business. Um, no, man, business is about people. I mean, and you're probably thinking, oh my God, enough already. It's about people, people, people. That's what it is. I say it's called a company because you do it with a bunch of other folks, right? Um, so your relationship with your employees, your relationship with your customers, your relationship with your partners, your relationship with your investors, they're all human beings. And if you understand this, I think you understand a whole lot more than the numbers and the spreadsheets and the Excel um, formulas that we often confuse business with. I'm not saying it's not all that, don't get me wrong. You need to understand that, but it's not the most important things. It's easier to understand concepts and it's very difficult to understand people. Um, my one before last is always focus on upgrading what you know. What got you here won't get you there. And if you're a musician, you know this because you're never good enough. You always have to practice. And that's one of the things that being a musician taught me, that you never stop practicing. John Coltrane, who knows John Coltrane? Yeah, no, I'm not talking. I know I'm not at Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> when about 1% of the population knows who John Coltrane is. He's a very famous saxophone player, maybe the greatest saxophone player who's ever lived. And John Coltrane was famous for being invited to go to dinner. And he would say, OK, when is, gonna, when is dinner going to be ready? Um, OK, cool. I'm going to be out here practicing. Call me. And I love that. I love that dedication, you know, because you're always about improvement. And the last thing is, when it stops being fun, move on. Now, I'm not saying the first day that it stops being fun, just like a marriage. You don't move on the first day that it stops being fun. Hopefully, you never move on because you found the perfect person. But you know it's not always fun, right? It's just the way that it is. But if it's just too much work, come on. I don't know if life is short as long, but I think life is way too precious. And I just think it's a shame to waste it on doing something you don't like. <laughs> so for me, life is about constant movement. It's about evolving and changing. And, and, and if you're always in environments where you are happy, but also you're a bit uncomfortable, it, you're always focused on, on, on renewal and becoming. And you're curious. Your curiosity is awakened because you're in a foreign environment, if you will. Um, so after I sold the company, and some of you may be thinking, gee, it sounds like you were having a good time. Why did you sell the company? Um, and I'll say a little anecdote. And I, because I'm talking in Europe, I think you guys will understand this. The day that I sold the company, it came out. The news were in the, was in the New York Times because in the music space were a big deal. And um, um, I remember you know, getting texts. And I was, I was in the back of a taxi because I was going to give some interview. And I was just feeling. It's a, it's a weird feeling. It's a weird feeling selling your business. It's you. I created this thing. I created it out of my apartment. It was me. Everybody thought that Sonic Bids was me. I spent endless amount of hours designing every little detail, even in my office, from the baseboards to the tiles to the chairs. It was, that, it was an expression of everybody, everything that I was. Um, but when I sold it, I remember my American friends started sending me congratulations. Ah, congratulations. It's a, in America, it's called an exit. You sold the company. You had an exit. You're making money. What do you do? Going to go back to the beach? Or going to go to the beach? I'm like, I grew up on the beach. I don't know. <laughs> Later. <laughs> um, all my European friends would be like, are you OK? Is everything OK? Are you fine? Because in Europe, we have a very, very different attitude about some things that we create. It's, you know, we build our houses and we stay in them forever. Americans, the house is a means to another house. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> I have a bigger house, I want to have a huge house. I have a huge house, I want to have the biggest house ever. And they become Bill Gates and you have the $20 million house. And I'm sure somebody has a $100 million house. But for us, it's different. So, um, you know, when people ask me, why did you sell the company? It took me a long time to think about this, but I felt that at my heart, I'm an artist. And I had nothing more to say. You know, just like a painter feels, I'm done. I've, I've added the last paintbrush. As a composer, I thought, I don't have another note to play. I'm not sure. I'm out of ideas. Um, and maybe some people take some, you know, I don't know. Maybe if you're Rupert Murdoch, it takes you 100, ide 100 million years to run out of ideas. I just didn't have anything else to say. Stop being fun for me. So of all the reasons on the planet, you know, it took me a long time to come to this. But I think it's sometimes it's time to acknowledge that you just have to move on. Why not? So at the time, the president of Berkeley was um, on my advisory board. Oh, sorry, on my board of, trust, uh, board of directors. And I was chair of the Berkeley Advisory Council for a long, long time. And he, we started talking about what are we doing to prepare our students for a very different industry. And I think, by the way, this is not just true in the music industry. I think this is true for any profession. You know, the workplace today is so, so, so different than say the one that I was graduating into in the 1990s. I, I like to say that today is not about finding the, per the perfect job, it's about creating the perfect job. It's not about fitting a piece on the puzzle, finding the right piece. You know, if you know what a quilt is, I think it's about weaving your own quilt. So it's, it's making the most, and it's always very unique. I think your career path is just something very unique that belongs to you, it's like your DNA. I think our career paths are very unique. So we started talking about this, and I thought, oh man, can you teach entrepreneurship? I mean, is this something you can actually teach? And initially, my reaction as an entrepreneur was, ah, you can't teach this stuff. You're born with it. You're a born entrepreneur. And then I thought, wait a minute. But if you have this attitude, then we would never educate anybody to be a musician, right? Or be a tennis player, or be a geologist, or anything. I don't know. I mean, maybe we have some you know, inclinations as human beings. But of course you can, you know, can, is everybody going to be Usain Bolt? No. Is everybody going to be Roger Federer? No. Or Paul McCartney? No. But can you coach people to run faster? Can you coach people to swing a racket better? Can you quote, coach people to be more musical? Of course. And I always like the word coach because teaching is about putting something in that may not exist. Coaching, though, is about pulling something out that exists. And because I believe that music and entrepreneurship are fundamentally human things, I think it's about helping somebody find a voice. And that's what Berkeley, from its inception, does. I want to take two seconds to talk about Berkeley. We have four and a half thousand students from over a hundred countries. We were founded 70 years ago exactly by an MIT graduate. But here's where Berkeley is different than every music school you know. It was founded on the principle of teaching the music of today, even in 1945, not the music of yesterday. And it was founded on the principle that we need to help our students cultivate their own voices, and very importantly, create something new. And, and this is where things get interesting. So I started thinking, OK, entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism at its core is about creating something new. So, I felt that the methodology that I will um, use at Berkeley is to build on the unique strengths that the institution has, its improvisational heritage, right? It's a jazz school. It's heritage on, on constantly evolving. Berkeley College of Music was the first college ever to teach the electric guitar as an instrument. When the electric guitar came out in the 1950s, by the way, you guys don't know this, but Leo Fender, who is the inventor of the electric guitar, is a Greek. So we gave the world not just democracy, but rock and roll. <laughs> um, but uh, we were the first college to teach music production and engineering, which was a brand new field. So in a funny way, the school was always opportunistic. We were the first music college to introduce the turntable, okay, like you've seen DJs, right, turntables, as a musical instrument. You know, and people rebelled at Berkeley, like, what do you mean the turntable or the computer is a music instrument? And I, I, I've told them, do you know that once upon a time, the saxophone was not considered to be a proper musical instrument when Adolf Sax invented the saxophone? 
you know, people thought, my God, that sucks. The electric guitar was supposed to be a toy, right? But music is an expression of society, and it evolves. And Berkeley has evolved. So I thought that these were conditions that were unique for me to create something that was very, very different. So we didn't seek to build an innovation or entrepreneurial center in the way that you would do it at MIT or Harvard or Stanford, but we sought to build on our own strengths, which is something that I want to encourage about us here in Cyprus. Let's not recreate the next this or the next that. Let's create the first this, whatever that is, whatever our unique strengths are. So I'll show you guys a quick video um, about our work that we're doing at Berkeley. I will jump, and let's all pray that it works. As an institution, we owe it to our graduates to give them not just the tools to be amazing performers or producers or sound designers, we also need to give them the corresponding tools to develop successful careers in a way that they define it. The Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship, which we call ICE, is an effort to encourage our students to both start enterprises, but also go beyond that and see themselves as artists, musicians, as an entrepreneur. It's trying to impart that entrepreneurship is not just management techniques, it's not business plan, it is a mindset. When I look at the instincts that make a successful musician, they tend to be good listening skills, good collaboration skills. Well, these are the same instincts that make successful entrepreneurs. The first course that I wanted to introduce is called the Startup Lab, because we fundamentally believe that innovation comes through collaboration. I reached out to Ken Zola at MIT, the Startup Lab, it's less about having one brilliant idea. Rather, it's about what it means for you to be the founder of a company and try to bring your vision to fruition. This is a prototype of the Power Mode. It's going to bring as many controls of a software synthesizer to your fingers as possible. It's going to strap onto your arm like this, and based on what buttons you press together at one time, you can get any pitch. Arriving to Berkeley, it was really sad to see that I was the only Bolivian. So I decided to do something and make a difference. Bolivian Sons of the World has the main goal of creating scholarships for Bolivian people to go to the best artistic schools around the world. This is telling you what your friends are listening to, who they're listening to, and what they think is cool. My current project is an app called Beatlist, and what we're trying to do is just reinvent internet radio. Every time your friend plays a song, it broadcasts the song, and then who they're listening to. The way that we like to go about teaching entrepreneurship here is similar to the way that people are learning a musical instrument. Practical application, and the second part is observation of other people doing it. We've selected four startups from the greater Boston area. These are companies that are all within the music space, but they're facing unique challenges. We work with the founders directly to do market research, to do product development, depending on what the goals of each business are. And it's one of the only opportunities at Berkeley that really allows you to do that. I'm working with Soul Nation. We are coming up with ideas for their first singer application. Once a week, I meet with our team at Berkeley to think about what kind of things we should do next in the project. What population are we going to be targeting next? What's the best way to approach this? They are our teammates. There's really no difference between the executive team and the Berkeley students. So I think that gives them a very unique perspective of what it means to start a company and how stuff really gets done. Hey guys, big round of applause. Music can be a catalyst for new disruptive ideas to emerge, whether those ideas are applied onto the creative or music space or whether those ideas are exported into other fields. No matter what major you're from or what path of life that you're going towards, a good base of entrepreneurial knowledge can help you turn your ideas into reality. We're talking to the most incredible, influential, smartest people that we've ever seen. We're getting all the most crucial information about the industry. We're getting the most unbelievable opportunities. It makes me want to work my butt off. 
Part of what makes Berkeley so special is that we have four and a half thousand amazingly creative people that have come from all parts of the world and within them they carry this unique voice that we want to help them express and hone and refine so they can go out there and develop their career in whichever way they choose and hopefully make a difference in the world. And that's what we aim to do with Berkeley Ice. <laughs> um, so, I gave a lot of thought to my background and how much music influenced the way that I approach my business. And even though my business was in the music space, I, I never thought that I was, if you will, in, that we had a music company. We, ha we were a technology company that were applying what we were doing to the music space rather than, say, a music company that was using technology. Um, but I started realizing that a lot of my jazz education played a big role in the way that I developed as a business person and, and as, a, as a human being. Um, and I'll tell you how music or why music is such an, an important element in, in, in thinking entrepreneurially. And, and I, I want to also say that entrepreneurship for me is not just about starting a company, but it's a way of relating to the world. It's a way of problem solving more than anything else. And that's why I said it's fundamentally a human activity. I mean, before there was industry, if you will, we were all entrepreneurs, right? Um, so I'll start with a few things. Um, if you're a musician, you, have, you can't play music unless you learn first how to listen and how to develop good listening skills. It's the same thing with starting a business. You have to be a good observer of your environment. The best entrepreneurs that I know are keen, keen observers of the world around them. Music is a collaborative act. You simply can't make it unless you work with a bunch of other people, whether it's in a group or whether it's in the recording studio. And business is all about pulling people together and pointing them in a unified direction to create a whole that's bigger than the sum of the individual parts. Um, in jazz, we have a saying that you know when to, that you have to know when to lead or when to comp. Comp in jazz is slang for accompaniment. And business is important. When do you, when do you stand at the center of the stage or when do you, you know, step back and give somebody else um, the microphone, if you will, knowing how to select leaders. Um, maybe when, if somebody asks me what's my main strength, I'll say two things. I know how to build relationships, and I'm one of the most disciplined human beings that I know around me. And that's something that I learned from just being a musician. It's basically sucking it up and going into a practice studio and practicing for eight hours, even though all your friends are having a good time. And I think that sometimes being an entrepreneur, I joke that it's like, it's like joining the priesthood. You know, It's not like you go back on Friday night and you are like, I'm not a priest anymore. Um, it's the same thing where an entrepreneur, it's a 24-7 activity. Um, this is important, especially for cultures like ours. I call it the F word. In, in English, it translates. <laughs> but um, failure is key. And when, I mean, how many of you play a music instrument or have ever played a music instrument? Come on. Everybody's played a music instrument at some point in life. The first thing that happens when you pick up a music instrument is that you fail at it, right? You just don't sound good. The first time you practice anything, you fail at it, but you accept that failure is part of the road to mastery. And we don't have a problem with it when we fail the first time, but somehow I think we teach endless amounts of young people that failure is a bad thing. But what if we reapproached it as part of the journey or part of the way to find out what works, right? I mean, Edison famously said, I forget exactly the quote about inventing the light bulb, that I, I didn't fail 999 times. I just found 999 things that just didn't work until I found the one thing that worked. Um, the other thing about jazz is that you learn how to improvise, but within a structure. And entrepreneurialism is a lot about balancing sort of concrete stuff with utter ambiguity. Um, and, and this is what I think intimidates a lot of people, that you can't control things. But that's what's cool about sometimes when, you, when you're improvising, when you're playing um, in, in a jazz band, that there is a particular structure, but within that structure, 
everybody is, everybody develops and expresses their own, their own voices. And the last two things that I'll say is about improvisation. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had to give a presentation like this and things go wrong. I mean, I don't, as a matter of fact, I don't know if the last time that anything went perfectly right. But being able to course correct, whether it's a presentation, whether it's in business, I mean, things go wrong all the time. So this, um, this improvisational mindset that I developed while I was in music school made a big difference. And then this is something that a very, very famous old client of mine told me. His, um, again, if you don't know John Coltrane, you may not know who Sonny Rollins is. But Sonny is, again, one of the most famous um, jazz saxophone players that's ever lived. He's probably 90 now. But he has a very famous song called Send Thomas, which is, for those of you who know jazz, you, it's, it's a jazz standard. Everybody learns how to play it. But I, I, I once asked him, I said, hey, like, what is it like to go on stage and play, play Send Thomas for like the billionth time? And he says to me, you know, every time before I go on stage, I go through this process where I unlearn my solo. I, don't, I never play the same thing twice. I try to consciously forget what I know so I can approach every circumstance as if it's brand new. And I think for me this concept is another, is another thing that is important. And it's frankly one of the reasons why when I left, when I f sold my company and I left after a year, I didn't want to go into the same thing that I was doing. I wanted to go through a process of unlearning and approach a situation as if I was fresh. And sometimes you can force that by just jumping into an environment that you know absolutely nothing about. I, I proudly knew nothing about academia. But I feel that sometimes that's when you're the most likely to stumble onto things that give you fresh insights. So just very quickly, what, what do we do at Berkeley? You saw a bit of a preview of that. But I like to say that our main objective is to expand our students' mindset of what they can do with a music degree. That being a musician is not just about being a performer. But, and I think you picked it up for the last you know, 30 minutes or so, it really helps you relate to the world and see the world in a particular way that I think makes you far more likely to be more innovative and, dare I say, more entrepreneurial. Um, so I, I, happen, I happen to live in the States where for the last few years we kept hearing about the need for everybody to become an engineer. And we were funding all these programs for technology-based skills, but we were taking money away from all arts and, creat and creative workshops and creative um, programs. I mean, music programs in most public schools in America is completely underfunded. But for me, being a creative being and be being, able, being able to apply creativity onto everyday problems coupled with solid um, uh, uh, you know, business or engineering skills is the fundamental key to future innovation. So for us, we're saying to our students, no, look, even if you don't develop a career as a musician, your education doesn't go to waste. That you, you're always going to be a musical being in all forms and ways of expressing it. So the principles that we use, and I, again, I'm, I'm hoping that some of these were self-evident even from the video. I like to say that everything that we do needs to uh, adhere to four basic principles. Number one, are we constantly pushing you outside of your comfort zone? Colleges, for me, are artificial environments. They're, they're human-made. It's the only time in your life where it's you and a bunch of people just like you. Not only just a bunch of people just like you, they have the same interests as you, and they're the same age as you. I mean, name another time after you graduate that that will ever be the case. So if you're telling me that college environments prepare our students for life, I don't know. Not to me. Um, the other thing is that um, colleges are usually environments where they're, you know, different disciplines are kept completely apart. I mean, even at an innovative school like Berkeley, our majors, you know, the person who does songwriting and the person who does recording and the person who does performing and the person who does music business never talk to one another, ever. Isn't it crazy? You would think, oh my God, I would think in a school like that everybody would get together. But life is about multidisciplinary approaches, right? I mean, we're all in this room, probably a lot of our colleagues we went to different schools, we're different ages, we bring different backgrounds and experiences. So I say let's push our students outside of their natural comfort zone. Some of, the, some of the things we do, we teach classes outside of the campus, right? Sometimes in offices. We actually have co-created classes with MIT and Harvard. And I love to see what it's like when we put students from totally different backgrounds together. 
You know, maybe it's because I, I'm a wannabe chef and I love throwing different ingredients and seeing how things taste. Um, the other one is, I mentioned this, you know, creating collaborative and cross-discipline experiences because innovation, as Steve Jobs famous, famously said, comes at the intersection of liberal arts and technology. And that's what sets Apple apart. Um, practical experiences and outcomes, everything that we're doing forces students, forces, encourages students to want to develop something that has an end result because much of life and much of a future employment is about delivering things. And then the last thing, um, I think for a while as a college we had this uh, belief that industry is something that happens out there and that, you know, our job is just to educate people. <laughs> We're too pristine, you know, it's, it's a sacred environment. Don't pollute it with all these people that eventually will become the employers of our students. <laughs> Let them wait. But the best colleges on the planet, like MIT or Stanford, have a very porous environment be between industry and academia. So everything we're doing is about creating as many relationships early on because that exposes our students to the way that employers think. But also, as I mentioned earlier, it, it makes them far more likely to come up with interesting ideas because they're constantly exposed to the fast pace of industry. Um, we have three basic areas. Um, one is the, an academic track where we're developing new courses, both online and offline. We bring speakers in, similar to what I'm doing here. Um, we create trips, so we're taking a bunch of musicians to Silicon Valley in January. Again, I love this concept of bringing people that normally would be like, what? There's a bunch of musicians you know, at Google Labs or at Facebook, what are they doing? But we want to encourage both sides, if you will, to talk to one another. Um, we have, we're developing the first ever creativity research lab. What does this mean? Um, if you know the media lab at MIT, we are building a media lab, if you will, for the creative space. So we're asking big questions. What's the future of the music industry going to be like? How are big technologies like wearable technologies or 3D printing um, or virtual reality uh, or augmented reality? going to affect the future of our music because as an institution we play, we have a responsibility to future-proof our students, if you will, by helping them develop the mindset that they need to approach the coming, the coming future. But also very importantly, we're telling these big tech companies, music is not just something that's been affected by technology, it's also something that has historically aided the mass adoption of technologies throughout the history. Phonograph was not invented initially as something to carry music, but it became a widely uh, popularized technology because of music. Broadcast radio, the same thing. Social media, the first adopters of social media was musicians. Cable television, for those who lived in America, music television or MTV was one of the things that helped popularize cable television in everyday American households because, as the slogan famously said, I want my MTV. This was young people demanding that MTV goes into their homes. So we see as mu music as a catalyst for innovation as well as something that is impacted by innovation. And also we're looking at big concepts like the impact of music on health and the way that it affects everything from Alzheimer's patients and Down syndrome kids and stroke victims. There's all kinds of stories of stroke victims who lost all mobility but they can still play music or people who've lost speech, but they can still sing, or people who have lost all memory, but they can still recite lyrics. So we see music as playing a bigger role in society than a mere form of entertainment. And then the last thing that we do is similar to what we're doing over here. We like to create environments that foster not just ideas, but people. Um, I often feel that we overstate the term acceleration but we understate the need for somebody to have a sheltered space in which they need to grow. And as we said, it's almost like a practice room. Fail safely. When you fail in the practice room, nobody's watching. That's why you go and practice. That's what's cool about it. Um, so our incubator is more of a practice room. It's a practice room for people, and it's a practice room for ideas that the college has. And my job, if you will, is to help those ideas become uh, either reality or die a quick death, one of the two. Um, so I'll end with two things. 
this will probably make no sense to a non-American audience because these are slang words. But a hipster is somebody who's cool, and a hustler is somebody who's going out there and making deals, right? So I say the old music business used to be about a hipster and a hustler, or an Elvis Presley and his manager, Tom Parker, uh, or a Beatles and their manager, Brian Epstein, right? Today, all business is about a creative alongside a business person, alongside a hacker is a technologist, for those of you who haven't heard the term. So business today is about bringing these three disciplines together, either in one person or by bringing different people in a multidisciplinary way and pursuing this. And I'll end with my favorite Eleanor Roosevelt quote, do one thing every day that scares you. I'll say that I'm scared to death almost every day because I really don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but if, if you want to push forward, if you want to go outside of your comfort zone, if you want to venture, which is the true definition of entrepreneurialism, then go on and do something every day that scares you. And the next thing you know, you've traveled a whole lot of scary path, and now it's no longer that. Thanks. Mm -hmm.